That's what. Eternity, yeah, that's. Okay, it's wrong. I can tell us your full name. Ruth, Rena, Levine. Right, and your maiden name. My name, maiden name is Dorfgang. Dorfgang, and you were born where and at what date? Częstochowa, Poland, October 15, 1932. Okay, uh, you were uh, a girl of seven when the Germans invaded. Not quite. Not quite. Uh, so. Almost. But what we want to know from, from you, if you can remember, it's obviously very hard for a girl of seven to remember, is tell us a little bit about Częstochowa, or Częstochowa, as it was called in Yiddish, and the kind of communal, community life you had, your home life, the Jewish life that you found. Well, I, I was the youngest of five children. Uh, we lived in the city, in the heart of the city. Uh, my father was a shoemaker but he had people working and he had sort of like a small enterprise and uh, he traveled a lot and uh, we had a Jewish home uh, laws were observed I didn't go to school before the war I went to a kindergarten my sisters went two of my sisters went to a a public school. My oldest sister was going to a high school, which was a Jewish high school. It was called the Jewish Gymnasium. And my brother was going to a, a trade school. And uh, what I can remember was a happy life. Uh, being the youngest, I was the spoiled brat of the family. I was given everything they could afford to give me, and I never lacked of any material things, and uh, I was getting ready to go to start school. I was enrolled in the Jewish gymnasium, which also had a great school, and I was supposed to start in September. At the age of seven, we start school in Poland, and then the war broke out. When the bro war broke out, I was not home. I wasn't in Częstochowa. I was because it being it being summer, I was sent to a relative that lived outside the city. Uh, it was like a small village. They had children, so I, a couple of my sisters and myself went and spent the summer there. And we were supposed to come home when uh, word came not to come home, not to send us back home that my parents and my, uh, my brother and the other sister are coming to join us because they thought they would be safer in the village than in Częstochowa itself. Let me interrupt you for a minute and I shouldn't, yeah. but in those years before the war broke out, do you remember any time, any problems with the Poles, the, the, the native Poles who lived in the city of Częstochowa? Yes, I remember that uh, um, one evening, my, my father got very upset because my brother wanted to go out, and he said, tonight is not a good night to go out. And uh, what I can remember is that it was Christmas, and because being a, a, a Catholic holiday, they were afraid that the, Jewish, the Jews will be either attacked or picked on or beaten up or whatever. And my brother insisted, well, he was, uh, I guess he was, a teenager, he was 18 or 19, and uh, he wanted to go with his friends. And I remember that kind of a hassle in the house, but I, I had friends that were both Jewish and non-Jewish, friends that you only met, played outside with, or went to the park and met them and played with. Uh, at that point, I didn't have any close friends that I, because I was going to kindergarten. I hardly remember any, anything. I remember my brother uh, taking me there on his bicycle, but I hardly remember what we did in kindergarten. Tell us a little bit about the, the memories that you might have of that last summer before your life was changed forever, the summer of 1939. Uh, well, the, the family I was with, that was uh, my mother's brother. They were very religious, very orthodox, and I remember that I, I didn't like it there because uh, 
uh, they said their prayers in the morning and night and insisted I say the prayers with them, which prayers I didn't even know, uh, but we repeated them and everything was very strict and we weren't allowed to do this or that and, and I didn't like it. I, I didn't like it at all. Uh, they had the youngest girl that they had was my sister's age, so there was nobody there really my age and I was being pushed around, you know, don't come here, you can't go there, you're too young, you can't go to the river because you're too young, you might fall in, you can't go to play in the park because you get lost, that type of thing. Uh, I didn't really enjoy that, kind of, that summer. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of the first day of war, September 1st, yes. 1939? Yes, I, I do have memories of that because my mother and father and my brother arrived and they said the Germans are getting closer, that they were bombed on the way, a lot of people were killed on the way, and that we can't stay in the house because uh, we are not safe, because they are bombing and if they bomb we all going to get killed. So the safest place is to go to a forest. That was a village that not far from a forest. I, Rather. And uh, we went to that forest, and there was more than just our family. There was the, my mother's brother with his family, my mother, my father, and my family. Then another, some other family. That, that was my mother had a lot of sisters, brothers, and there was another sister with her husband and two girls that also came. Everybody thought there would be, I don't know why. At the time, I couldn't understand why they thought that in the village they would be safer than in the city. Maybe because of the bombing. So we all went into the forest, and I remember being petrified because everybody was telling me to hold on to a tree and stand there, not to move. And it was raining and thundering, and they were afraid that they were going. Uh, we were walking through the forest. That there were some holes where you could fall in and water and it was just terrifying and I was very happy when it started getting light and, and they decided to come back to go back and when we came back the, the house was ransacked my uncle had a little grocery store and everything was ransacked and broken up and everything and we didn't stay there we long. Ransacked. The Poles, not the Germans, but we didn't see a German yet. Uh, up till that point, nobody saw a German yet. And um, my father decided it's time to go back to the city. Of course, there were no trains, no buses, nothing was moving. So he bought a horse <laughs> and a wagon. <laughs> and we started on the way back. And uh, that's when we encountered the first Germans uh, with tanks and, and armored cars, and of course the horse got scared and he wouldn't move, <laughs> he wouldn't walk, and my father had to walk with the horse and tie his eyes so he wouldn't see all the armored cars and the tanks, and in retrospect it's funny, but at the time it wasn't because uh, we were afraid that the Germans will push us off the road or, or kill us or whatever. Did they pay attention to you? No. They were going the other way, really. Most of them were on the other side of the road, and we, we finally arrived back, and we went back to our apartment where we lived, and, and the war was on. What did you uh, find when you went back? What kind of a city? Had the city changed? I, I couldn't tell, because I wasn't allowed to go out. I wasn't allowed to... I really didn't know much what was going on. All I knew that I wasn't going to go to school. And that was, that was the biggest thing for me. I mean, that was something I was looking forward to. And here it wasn't going to happen. And uh, at that point, I really, I don't think I had a, uh, I, I realized what war meant, what was going to happen or what. What were your parents talking about? Uh, my parents uh, seldom talk, but well, usually when I was around and they didn't want me to know much, they spoke Yiddish. So did you? At that time, no. No? No. Completely Polish. Polish. 
because uh, when you went to a Polish school and if you had a little bit of a uh, Yiddish accent, they made fun of you and they would beat you up or whatever. So you tried not to speak to the children Yiddish so the children would have a, a good Polish accent with dictions. And uh, being seven, I didn't pick up that much. Maybe later on, I did pick up some because uh, through the German and the, mm -hmm. but uh, most of my Yiddish I picked up from my husband <laughs> after so really, I got married. Yeah, so really you could have passed for a non-Jew because you I did. You did, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so how long does this go on? But, uh, nothing is happening in terms of uh, doing anything to you. Poland's doing anything. Well, that was uh, let's say in, uh, 39. Um, a few months later, they decided to separate the Jews from the Poles. When would this be? Uh, probably in 40. Beginning of 1940. 40, uh, yeah. And they designated a part of uh, the city uh, where all the Jews are going to live, and part of the, you know, a smaller part, okay, and it was called the Big Ghetto. The reason it was called the Big Ghetto is because later on they cut it and, and they made a small ghetto. <laughs> so uh, that one was called the Big Ghetto and uh, we had to move. The part we lived wasn't in the circle. In the area. In the area right. So we had to move and that's when we moved um, what they did is they picked from the city uh, people that they wanted to work for them, okay? Like there was a shoemaker and a tailor and a lingerie maker and all tradesmen. And they put us all in one building. And that building was the last building of the ghetto and was out of the ghetto. To get into this building, you had to have a pass. Okay, and that building had two entrances, and on both sides were uh, German. A German soldier was standing, and he let you in and out if you showed your papers. Okay, and I wasn't allowed to go to the right where I would go to the Aryan side. I was only allowed to go to the left where I would walk into the ghetto. But, but the, the, your parents and the other people there could go to the Aryan side to work. No, we, we, they all worked in the building, in the apartment, in the apartment. And my father had people come in. He had, at that time, maybe four or five people that still worked for him and helped him. And he started making boots for the German officers. Not for the Jewish community. No, Jewish no, officers. just for the German officers. And yeah. everybody, everybody that worked uh, for the Germans there strictly, did strictly work for them. They came and they said what they wanted, and of course they had to bring everything that you needed, uh, the product, because we we couldn't go out and buy, and so they and and they seldom paid you anything. I mean, you just worked for them. If they wanted, they gave you a few um, zlotas or whatever. What was happening to the rest of the Jewish community? Was there one being? Was there a ghetto? Being yes, yes, and there was a, a, a committee, a committee, and, and a mayor was elected, and, and, and it, functioned, it functioned just like a city. The stores were open, and trades were going. We went to school there. I mean, it wasn't legal. Everything was illegal. Uh, I went to school. I started school. It wasn't a regular school. It was in, in some teachers' apartment and she had classes divided. Children were according to age and classes were divided. Each room had a different teacher and a different uh, grade. And uh, we studied. We, we started with, uh, I started with grade, with the second grade. And uh, we went through the books one after the other. I mean, we didn't finish one and had vacation or we had a break or whatever. We just picked up another book and continued. So in the two years until the, uh, uh, they liquidated the ghetto, until 42, 
was October 42. I finished four and a half grades. I was in the fifth grade. <laughs> because so it's nine just years old. Uh, just about close to 10 years old. And it wasn't 42. Would you say that you, you sensed that your life was different, but at the same time almost the same? Did you feel, how does it feel not to be able to walk outside of a, of a building? Well, uh, I, 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 I wasn't afraid and I didn't care. And at that time, the building we lived in, part of the population was uh, Polish, not Jewish. And there were a couple of little girls and I made friends with, and I used to go out with them to the Aryan side, I used to dress up, put a scarf over my head, and I used to go out. And the problem was that once in a while, they were, somebody would stop and say, oh, you must be Dorfgang's little girl. What are you doing here? See, and after that happened, uh, when I came home and told my mother, and I wasn't allowed to do it anymore because they were afraid if somebody starts yelling, do, 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 that some German will get you and shoot what you on sight. What was the penalty for being caught Death. outside in the Aryan zone, in the Aryan zone? Death. Death. Yeah. No matter how old you were? No. Did you ever see anything like this? People being caught or... No, but I... Treated by the Germans? Jews? Yes. But that was later. That was in 42 when they started sending people to Treblinka and they closed the ghetto and what we call the Aktia started. Do you want to talk any more about your life in those two years? Oh, there wasn't that much. There really wasn't that much. We went, there was a lot of typhoid going on. I remember uh, went to to school or wherever we went to the teacher and we found the, uh, the doors closed, you know, with the signs, typhoid, you can't enter and all that. Your teacher had contracted? It's somebody in the building, not my teacher, somebody in the building. So we found another place and uh, it really wasn't, wasn't that much difference. To me, life just went on. Did you have to eat? Yes. At that point we had... Uh, where I could go and uh, being young and being not looking very Jewish, uh, I would go even to the Aryan side to a store and buy whatever. As long as you had money, you could get anything. Is that true for the entire Jewish community? Yes, as long as you had money. And the people that didn't, that, that were poor, I know there was always a helping hand. I, every Friday, my my mother. Every Friday, there was uh, uh, my mother sent packages. You go there, and you go there, and you deliver, and that was my oldest sister's task, and and she didn't really like to go every time, <laughs> every Friday, but she did. Nevertheless, she went and and she did deliver a challah to this guy and a bread there and a few zlatas here, and uh, so people helped people. Uh, nobody was starving at that point. Nobody let anybody else starve. Did the Germans allow religious services to go on? Not, not uh, officially, no. But there were services going on. People met in private apartments and conducted. Uh, I know my father went every Saturday morning. He went to services. So at this time, the Germans hadn't taken anybody away from the ghetto? No. Everybody was just concentrated in, in the blocks that they allowed, in the part of the city that they allowed. So it was really a little city in a city? Uh, correct. Yeah. What happens now in 1942? 1942. It's Yom Kippur. And before, a little bit before, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, people were talking. Of course, I didn't know what they were talking about, and I didn't exactly understand everything that was going on. But the day after Yom Kippur, they closed the ghetto. Nobody was allowed to go out, because there were people that were working out of the ghetto. You were allowed to go out if you had a pass. So people were going back and forth, and there were Poles coming into the ghetto that worked. At that time, they still worked for the Jews, for some Jews. And trades were going back and forth. I mean, tradesmen and it was like, like you said, a city within the city, and life was going on like always did. 
But that particular day, the ghetto got closed. There were SS all around the ghetto. Nobody was allowed in, and nobody was allowed out. So we knew something was happening. We just didn't know what. And then the trains came, and the Aktiep again. And everybody, they would. What's an Can you describe it for us? It, it, really, the word comes from auction. They would close one or two streets, close off, and tell the people to come on the street, to get out on the street. And they would line them up, and the SS would stand. Well, of course, he had a whole bunch of, but there was one particular one that was in charge of it, and he would stand and had a little, like a baton, and he would say, you go to the right and you go to the left. And most of the older people and children would go to the left, and the young, able-bodied people would go to the right. And the people that were on the left were put on trains and disappeared. Did you see this? Uh, no. I didn't see it then. But I did, we did hear the trains because we were pretty close to the train station. And. Uh, at first, we didn't know where they were going. And uh, of course, they were sad. At first, they were saying they are, they are resettling the Jews. Uh, everybody that goes voluntarily is going to go to Germany, get resettled, is going to get an apartment and a job, and all the good things in life. So a lot of people just went willingly. And then some were segregated. They were divided. You know, the younger people were left, and the older people with their families. Of course, when, when a child was taken, the mother and the father most times went with the child. And uh, they were sent away. We didn't know where. But about, uh, about two weeks later, that I remember, uh, a man came. Came to our apartment because he knew my father. And he came, it was late at night, he came and he said that he was in Treblinka, that they are sending all the Jews to guest chambers to, to die. They're killing them systematically. And who doesn't, who doesn't die in the guest chamber, they bury him alive. They dig holes and they throw everybody in, and if you're alive or dead, you get buried anyway. And he had an infected hand because he jumped from the train. As when they were getting close to Treblinka, he jumped off the train, and he got caught on a wire or something, and he got uh, hurt, and the hand got infected. But he, instead of coming right back, he followed the train, the tracks, to see what's happening. That's how he found out what was happening. He was the first one that came back and told us that. And the reason I remember, because I was the one that was sent to go to a doctor, to a doctor, to the Aryan side, of course. At that time, it was late at night. Nobody was allowed out. Even the Poles had a curfew. But I went, it was, I can't even describe, I don't even remember, you know, through back streets. And I got to the doctor, a doctor that my father knew. And I had money with me, and I said, this is how much you get now. If you come with me and help the men, you get that twice as much again. This was a Polish doctor. A Polish doctor. Because in this building where we lived, we did not have a doctor. And I couldn't get in the, into the ghetto. See, I could go out easier than to, to smuggle myself into the ghetto. Because I couldn't get that guy, the doctor, out from the ghetto. But the Polish doctor could walk into that building. So I got the doctor, and he came, and he opened his wound and cut whatever, cleaned out, and he did save his hand, which he said at first that he wasn't sure. But I remember that everybody was sitting, and it wasn't just my family, because they knocked on some on the neighbor's door, and they came, and before morning, everybody knew that that man came back from Treblinka and what was going on. And of course, well, there were some people that didn't believe it. He says, it couldn't be. Nobody can take people and put them in a chamber and gas them and kill them. It's impossible. How can you believe anything like that? 
I didn't understand. When he said that people were being buried alive, I didn't understand the word he used. I never heard before. And I did your parents react, or did the community react to this news in a certain way? Or as you say, people believed, some didn't. What happened when this man came? Well, uh, I really don't know because, like I said, <laughs> I was 10 years old. Even if, if I heard things, I didn't always understand what they were talking about. It was, but uh, they did have, uh, I think there were some young people that organized and they did try to kill the one that, the, SS that was in charge of the whole thing, you know, he was the head of, of the act, yeah. but of course they failed and they were all killed on the spot. And we heard about it. That did not happen in the building where I, we lived, in the ghetto, in the ghetto. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we heard about it, but because there was like a network of news, people uh, were telling what, what was happening, and there were always people that were sneaking in and out of the ghetto, and there was always somebody that would come and, and tell you the news, what was happening and all that. that. That went on, I don't remember how long it went until they liquidated the whole ghetto, and they left some, they took about four streets and, and made a small ghetto, and whoever was left was lived in that part of the city. And we were the, the last building that had a, uh, a selectia, what we were selecting people to go to. And I remember that day. Well, before that, I, if I, you asked me before whether I saw anybody killed. The first time I saw someone being killed is when there was a, a selection that you could, we could see from our uh, not upper floor, was under the roof. There was like a little attic, and there were a couple of small windows, and somebody said that you, if you go there, you can see people were selecting, that they were selecting from the people that lived on the street on close to the building. And I went up, and I was looking through, because being young and small, I snuck in under somebody there and stuck my head out, and I was looking. And there was a little girl that was maybe six years old with her parents. She was beautiful. And they wanted to take her away and leave the parents because the parents were young and beautiful people, good looking, and they wouldn't let her go. And they said they won't let her go by themselves. They want to go with the child. So he took out the gun and shot the girl. He says, now you don't have what to go for my first encounter with death. Did it stay with you? I can still see it. And the second one was when I looked out the window one day and somebody walked out underneath where we lived in the building. There was a man that was, uh, he, has a, he had a factory there. He was fixing furniture or something. And, and another man that lived in the building walked out, but somebody was, some Germans and Polish officers, Polish police were looking for somebody that supposedly was sneaking out of the ghetto, and uh, somehow they thought that he was the one that came from the ghetto, and they shot him right, right underneath our window. And that was a man that I knew personally that I would come visit, play cards with my father, uh, that I went to visit their house because there were children there. Somebody that, that you knew that was, it was horrifying to see the blood. When I saw the little girl being shot, it was quite a distance. It was a little, you know, it was like over a couple of roofs. But this was right under our window. 
Right, so that was number two. Then I started to understand what was going on. That people didn't just go away on trains. People were being killed dead. I mean, they were not coming back. Up till then, I didn't really understand what that meant. I, d I never saw that person. I never had anybody in my family die. So that was, it was quite horrifying. Um, what happened then when, when the collapses became greater, uh, was there a feeling that well, something's going to happen to my family? Yes. We were always afraid. What if I'm left alone? What if they take me alone? That was always with you. You couldn't stop thinking about it. I'm going to be left alone, or I'm going to be taken along. And you always worried about it. That was the biggest worry. And then uh, when they closed the ghetto and they put all the people, they also liquidated the building where we lived. They took out a few people and sent them away. And the rest they put in the small, small ghetto, and that's where they work. But when that happened, my father said, this is not a place for me. I have to get out. Because if anybody sh sees me or the next time, I'm not going to survive. And if they take me, they'll have to go too. So I was sent away. I was packed off to a Polish family that my father knew. Where? In Chernstown. He was one of the people that, my father was uh, head of the uh, Shoemakers Association, and he knew that man because he worked with him, or he knew him from the, I don't know how, but he knew him. And he offered him money, very simple, and for money he said he will take me. They lived a little bit out of the city, like on the suburb. And uh, they had their own little house, so it wasn't their apartment where you had to go in and see people every time you went in and out, because they had their own little house, consisted of two rooms only. And uh, so one day I just walked out, and I was told where to go. He had a little store in the city. And I went there, and I waited until his wife came, and uh, she took me with her home. And I stayed with them for 14 months. That was through all the small ghetto. When the small ghetto got liquidated, which uh, by then all the people uh, were either sent to, to death or uh, to work camps, I was with a Polish family. Tell us about the life in that family. The life in that family. They were, they were all the people. They, were, uh, they, already had, they had one daughter, and she was married, already had two children. They living there too? No. She, she and her husband, the children lived a little farther away, but uh, where they lived, there was no school around there. So the older boy, which was my age, he was about a year younger maybe, was going to school. So he lived most of the time with his grandparents. Because, so he could go to school. He also had asthma. So it was easier to get a doctor or get medication when he had an attack where they live, rather where his parents live. So that way, that meant that they came to visit quite often. Okay. Now the daughter was told who I was. The son-in-law wasn't because they knew that he was anti-Semite. They knew he was against the Jews. He knew that if he finds out, we are all dead. So they didn't tell him. They told him I was a, a niece, a cousin's daughter that came from a village somewhere. And for a while he bought it. For a while he didn't see me. The first few months he didn't know I was there. Was Every, yeah. But every time he came to visit, I disappeared. Okay? I, I was, if he was in the kitchen, I was in the bedroom, if, or, or the other way around. Uh, they also had like, uh, they were building another, this was sort of supposedly like a temporary house, and they were building another one across the uh, way where you walked in, where there was like a gate. Nobody else came in. 
and there was so there was like an unfinished house there that nobody walked in because there were no steps. So I would climb up and walk over a board to the second floor and then pull the board with me so nobody else could come. And I spent quite a few days there and quite a few evenings. So the, few, the first few months, I, he didn't know I was there. But then when he found out, for, for a while he bought the story that, that I was uh, somebody's child. But then he started getting suspicious, and he started, uh, he wrote me a letter, he handed me a letter, that somebody knows that I'm Jewish, and somebody's going to tell the Nazis, and somebody the SS, and I better pay so much money, and so on. How did you figure this young girl? He figured if I tell uh, uh, whoever I tell, they'll give him money, because he knew they were getting money. Okay, because they were quite poor, and all of a sudden there were things in the house, all of a sudden there were new pieces of furniture, all of a sudden there was a lot of uh, nice, beautiful linen that were uh, once my mother's, uh, there was a lot of silver that was my mother's, and uh, so he, he wasn't uh, stupid. So uh, the payment was not only in, in, in money, but also in material things? In material things, plus a payment, a weekly payment. Weekly payment. You were a Jewish girl living in a Catholic home. How did that affect your relationship with them? How did they treat you? Well, the, the, the woman, she tried to make a good Catholic kid out of me. You know, the first thing I learned, uh, the whole book of prayers. You know, so if I go to church, I would know how to pray. Did you go to church with Yes. At the beginning, I was openly, I mean, I lived with them, I went with them, everything was on the, up, as, a, as a Polish kid. So if they went to church, I went to church. They prayed, I prayed. I, I knew better the prayers than the grandson. I would teach him, you know. I had to know it better. My life depended on it. And I had false papers that my father arranged, you know, everything was, uh, you could get, you could buy anything you wanted. If, if you had the money, you could buy. But life wasn't easy because she kept telling me, don't worry, if your parents won't survive, I'll keep you, even without the money. We'll, we'll get you to, to confession, and after that we'll uh, make a Catholic out of you. And you'll be with us, be one of us. What did you think about that? Not much. I didn't want to. I did not want to be Catholic. Once in a while I would get mad at my parents. If I didn't hear from them for a long time, I would get mad. They don't want me, they don't love me, they don't care about me. I'm going to be a Catholic. I thought that was the worst possible thing I could think about, to, to want to be a Catholic. Your parents make contact with you. My father always had a lot of people knew. He always knew people, and he people knew him. And for for Bach, anybody, even Polish policemen, would would deliver letters to the store, never to the house, always to the store where where that old man had the store. And and that's how. And he would take and give it to the policeman. There was, there was one in particular policeman, and he would deliver it to my father, to, a get, to the ghetto, or later on to the camp, and uh, he would do it through the, through the gate. He would come to the gate, to the wire, and just hand it through. And he did that. So if you, mm -hmm. you could manage. So for 14 months this happened, uh, yeah. why did it stop? Like I said, uh, he, he started getting nasty. He started blackmailing me. Yeah. I had to tell the mother. I had to tell her what was going on. And then I went to visit my father and mother where they took him out from the small ghetto and they put all this, this group of people that were in the building that was called number 14 because they were in the, the number on the house was full, on the building was full. They got put in a separate building again, out of the ghetto, 
out of the camp, the labor camp. By then, everybody was in labor camp. There were three labor camps in the city. And they were all uh, big factories that were uh, um, converted to munition factories. Okay? And, and they needed the Jew, the free labor, to work those factories. So in the, in the, in the ghetto, Jews were just living a, a daily existence. Now, they were contributing Now, to out of 40,000, when the Aktion in 42 started, there were between 40 or 42,000 Jews in the city. Now they were down to about 10 or 12 in, in the three different camps. Now there were there are a few families that were in this one building on the street, and I used to go visit there, my father, once in a while. And every time I would come, I would say, I want to go home. I want to come and live with you, meaning home. And he said, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. But when I came, well, there was one time that somebody, some of a couple of Polish boys heard me call my father dad. And when we started walking away with that woman, they started running after me, yelling, Jew, Zhidovechka. And uh, I was lucky that I knew the streets a little better and was faster than they were. Otherwise. I wouldn't be sitting here. And uh, what would they have done to you? They they personally wouldn't have done anything. But if SS went by and heard, all he would do is just take out a gun and shoot me on the spot. He wouldn't ask questions. He would shoot first, then ask, then check if I really was a Jew or not. So when, when the situation got so bad at home that she was afraid, they, they were afraid that, that he will go to the SS. This is the old Polish couple. The right? old Polish couple. So I went to, I let my mother know that I am going to come and visit on a specific day, specific night, evening, I don't know. And I told her what was happening and, and they decided, I went back with the, Pol with the Polish woman to the, to the house, but they decided that they will try to smuggle me in. That was the only way they could do it. Because officially they couldn't come and say, we have a, daughter, a little girl that up till now was with a Polish family. Can we take her now with and, and keep her with us? You couldn't do that. So one evening I came and I just snuck in. I, I had all kinds of ways and means of getting in and out of places that nobody else could. And I came in and uh, I was there. What and year was this? That was already 44. That was the year 44. I was uh, And right after I was there, maybe, maybe no more than a couple weeks, and they sent them to the camp, to Hasag. One of the uh, one of the labor camps in the city, so the munition, the the whole group of people that were in that building. Number fourteen. Number fourteen. Well, that was already on Galba Diego. It was a different mm -hmm. building, but they were also together, and they were still working for the Germans. They were all, still all those trades people that did the work for the. And when we were in the labor camp, uh, my father used to go out of the camp every morning and work in a building, again, it was a building in, in a different place where they made work rooms for everybody and they worked there. And they did the same work, continued to do work for the, for the German uh, Wehrmacht, for the SS, for whoever needed, but was German. And uh, that's how he could bring food into the camp for us. And so, your family together entirely, brothers? The whole time. No, my brother was not with us. My brother left for Russia at the beginning of the war. That's a story in itself, a different chapter in, in, in the book. Uh, my, my brother by then was in Russia. So there was just my uh, mother, father, three of my sisters, and my oldest sister got married, and her husband. All living together in how many rooms? Both rooms. <laughs> when we got to the labor camp, we were lucky that they let us build a room in a, it was a hall where there were 1,200 women lived in that one hall. So you can imagine it was quite 
quite a hole, I mean, it was big. And uh, there were two or three of our families got a little spot there, and we got cardboard and uh, built a little, I don't know, call it a room. It was more like a closet. There were enough room for two double bunks, and that was our room. And there were eight people living in this little hall, being eaten up by bedbugs all the time, because the cardboard consist was filled with bed bugs. And in the morning when you got up you just did that. <laughs> you wiped off your bed bugs. And uh, I was there like I said, it was already forty four. And most of the time I didn't even work. I I did go to work supposedly and I was my father was paying the German woman that was in charge of that uh, part of the factory, so she would let me sit there and work. Because she didn't work. Because if I didn't work, where would I be? I couldn't be in that little room because they checked constantly. And if I was, if I was found wandering around or doing nothing, I mean, sitting somewhere or doing nothing or walking around, where did I come from? Where I'm, well, what am I doing there? Uh, that labor camp had about 2,000 people or so. I was the youngest child there. There was, a, there was a child born there that was being hidden all the time. Nobody knew about him, and he survived. He was two years old when the war ended, which was like a miracle. And I didn't know about it until after. Till after the war, I didn't. Even I didn't know. But I was the youngest in the camp, and everybody knew. All the Jews knew about me. The Germans didn't. And if I walked through, and somebody was coming, a German or, or a Polish guard or any other guard, they would. The child is here. The child is here. You know, it was like a broken telephone. Everybody was watching out for me, so nobody would catch me or nobody would see me. And so everybody was always protecting me. Uh, so that's how, how come everybody knows me, I don't know anybody. If anybody from our city remembers me, I, I'm the only one that doesn't remember anybody. So you had no one to play with during this time? I don't think you even thought about playing. What? Playing? You were lucky if you found an old book that you could read, or if your sister told you a story. You didn't think about playing. You, you were thinking about surviving. She said to you, what was your childhood like? That wouldn't make any sense I, to you. No. I didn't have much of a childhood. My childhood started after the war, and that wasn't a, I was By then I was 12 years old, almost 12 and a half. And my childhood was over. I wasn't a child anymore. By then I was uh, a child with a grown-up uh, soul with a soul that suffered more and so more than anybody should at that age, at that age. That uh, all I could think about, the time I spent the whole night in a closet, sitting with my knees under my chin without being able to move a day and a night, because it was Christmas and they were celebrating, and I didn't have an, a chance to get out of the house to go to the other building. I got stuck in a closet, not in a big walk-in closet, in a little armoire closet, you know, full with clothes, with smelling clothes, with no air to breathe. <laughs> so how long did this last phase of your life in the Holocaust? A few months. That, the, we were liberated January, in January of 45. By whom? By the Russians. That day, they said, the Germans said, a word came out, everybody should come to the uh, uh, court or whatever, where, where the main court where everybody, where you came every morning to be counted. And uh, everybody should go there. 
And of course, some people went, some people didn't go. They were uh, a day later, a day earlier. Somebody came and they said the Russians are very close. How they knew, what they knew, how that the rumor started, I have no idea. Uh, but there was a rumor that the Russians are by in the city or close to the city, over the river. They'll be in any day. So when the Germans said everybody should come to the Appell Platz, my father said, no, you're not going. Nobody's going. So one of my sister was working here and the other one was working here. And there was a big, uh, there was a disorder that day. Nobody, usually you work 12 hours from morning till night and then the second shift worked from night till morning. And all of a sudden, all the shifts were at work, and there were too many people for the machines, and there were some places there were no people, and it was a, quite a balagan, as they say. <laughs> and uh, uh, my father said, nobody go call Hella, and Paula is there, so you go get them. So we got the whole family together, and we went, we hid in a, a storage building where they had uh, boxes. You know, all those uh, munition, uh, the place, the labor camp where we were, we produced uh, rifle bullets. And those bullets used to get boxed in boxes, and the small boxes went into a bigger box, and the bigger box got into a big carton box, okay? So all those boxes, but there was one building, uh, not quite a building, it was like a, a shack, with a thin roof over it. But that was full with, with all those cartons. And my father said, we all go in there and sit and wait. So we had, of course, I was there first and waited for them to come. And, and so for a while I was by myself, which was scary. But eventually everybody was there that night. And some more people came, other people came. In the meantime, we heard that the people that went to the Appell Platz, there was a whole train. They filled the train and took him away. And the people were sent to Germany, where most of them died on the way, because they were sent to some other camps, and some were taken on a march, and most of them died. Very few survived that left the city. Uh, and all that we heard every time somebody walked into the uh, shack and, and had some more news what was happening. And it was like uh, maybe around one o'clock in the morning, a couple of Jewish boys came, guys, young guys to me, they looked grown up, but uh, my father used to say a couple of boys, meaning they were maybe 20, with rifles on their shoulders, and they said, brothers, we are free. The Russians are here, and the Germans are gone. Uh, afraid. Was still afraid. It was dark, it was night, and my father said, let's get out of here. We don't want to be in a munition factory. Because anything ignited, it blows to so we started walking into the city. And of course, on the way, they were still fighting in the street. There were Russians and there were Germans. There were German tracks with, with German soldiers uh, driving away, and they were shooting. We tried to hide, so one place we went in, and my father turns around, looks, and there's trucks with munitions standing. It was a German <laughs> building with German munitions. It says, out of here, we can't stay here. So went a couple more houses. Finally, some uh, Polish people did let us in into the building, not to the house. I mean, not to their apartment, but into the building, because every building had like a door in front that you locked. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they opened and let us in, and we stayed until morning. When we got out in the morning, in daylight, there were no Germans. You couldn't see Germans, you only saw Russians. So we went and my father found a friend, Polish, 
that led us into the building, led us into his apartment, fed us breakfast, and he told us that two stories down there was a German family lived there, a German officer in that apartment. He says it's probably empty. So we walked in, it was empty, and we walked in and took it. And that's where we lived for, for the, few, the first few months. Did you have any contacts with, Europe, with the Russians? Not much, not much. The, 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 the first contact we had when they caught a couple of guards uh, from Ukraine. There were a lot of Ukrainian guards that guarded all the factories and all the camps. And, and I don't, They shot them right there. We wasn't as horrifying by then as seeing Jews being killed. <laughs> They're like, it wasn't very nice either, you know, because they were begging for their life, and the Russians just shot them. And I couldn't understand even then why, how, how can you shoot a person just like that, just because he's there or, or because you don't like him, you just shoot him. But they did. Uh, how many times I slid on? Well, here we are in January of 1945. Your family is free. The Russians have come. What, what did your family think? Were they going to start life again in Częstochowa? Was there no future for them in Poland? I, I really don't know. Uh, like I said, I don't know. My father didn't discuss those things with me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't told that much. Mm -hmm. Uh, children were supposed to be seen and not heard of, <laughs> from. <laughs> but uh, I think his first priority was to feed his family. Uh, how do you feed somebody? You, you know, where do you start when you have nothing? We had almost nothing. We, even though my father did have some money in the camp where he paid for me and all that, but all that dwindled down to nothing. Jewelry and all the, the all slowly, slowly everything went. And the Poles had it. Yeah. And and there was very little left. We we each had a little. I had a little ring, and all my each of my sister had a little gold ring, just in case. You kept it, and you 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 hid it, and you saved it, just in case maybe one day you might need to save your life with it. You know, if a Pole says there's a a Jew. And uh, maybe if you give him a piece of gold, he'll let you run away or, or hide or something. So each, everybody had something. But there was very little left, and where do you start? My father, like I said, he was in the profession, and he, uh, he knew a lot of people. And there was another uh, Jewish person that survived, and he had a big store before the war, a shoe store. And that store was now empty. Through the war, it was empty. Nobody occupied it. So he went to the uh, government, or whoever represented the Polish government, said, this was my store. I want to open a store there. Said my, to my father, you come with me. We'll open a shoe store. But to open a shoe store, you need shoes. <laughs> you can't open. So while they were trying to buy and deal and go and see where and the war is still going on. This is January, February, right? In the meantime, my mother bought five loaves of bread, which us girls stood in line to get each one a loaf, put it in the window, and in five minutes she doubled her money. Right? She says, in that case, tomorrow we're going to buy 20. And that's how they started a grocery store. <laughs> Where was your apartment, the old apartment? No. no. Well, somebody lived there. We did go. The reason we went because we left. We left my. Uh, well, of course, all the furniture, everything was left. But in one of the china closet, I remember it was a huge china closet, really big, big. It was a felt bottom in one place, and in there, my mother put away all the pictures and documents. Okay. And she says, I don't want anything, but I want those pictures and I want the documents. So she went 
to the people that lived in that apartment. She said, I just want to go to that china closet and take out something. And she says, we don't, she wouldn't let it through the door, uh, to the she threshold. Knew, the lady who owned the apartment before. Yeah, well, my mother introduced herself and she said who she was and, and she, she wouldn't let it through the threshold. She says, we don't have any of your furniture. We threw everything away and we have nothing of yours. Wouldn't let her in. She was afraid that she'll want the furniture back or something. So we never, never you recovered any. No, no, no. And uh, like I said, they started the, the store and then the Russians, the, we moved from the one apartment where we were to another apartment which was empty. And that was uh, a building that was almost empty. And it, there were some storage rooms there that uh, were Germans, and of course the Russians took it. So that was where the store was. And I started school. I started going to school again, and my sister started going to school. What kind of school was it? It was a public school. It was a sixth grade. I started went to sixth grade, it was in the middle of the school year, but I went in and they gave me, a, they tested me and she said, oh, you'll do all right. By the end of the school year, I was at the head of the class, which uh, didn't do me much good because uh, I wanted to go to high school. And uh, when I went for an interview, uh, the head of the high school, the principal of the high school said, Oh, well, you are Jewish, aren't you? You probably won't stay around too long. Why don't you just wait and see what happens? She wouldn't enroll me in the school, <laughs> in the high school. And you were between 1939 and 1945. Things had changed a little bit between Jews and Poles. What, was well, the what, what changed? The hatred? Well, the Poles really were at the yeah, Did the Poles were, no, 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 they didn't have, change on the contrary. I think they hated the survivors. The ones that survived, they hated them more than they hated the Jews before because they survived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did you survive? My mother went to the, the, to the couple that kept me. They got rich. Right? They, they took all our possessions plus money and they built a house and they, my mother came, went and said, you keep everything. I don't want anything that I gave you, any of my possessions. There's one thing I want, the candlesticks that were my grandmother's. That's the only thing, and I'll pay you dearly for them. And she said she didn't have them anymore. And, and that's a woman that professed to love me like her own child that kept telling me, don't worry, if they die, they die, you will be ours. But now that, that we didn't die and we survived, she had, they hated us with a passion. Never saw him again. My mother said, you come and visit us, this is where we live. We are friends, we are grateful to you because you, you saved our child. Never showed, never came, never showed any interest. So the anti-Semitism flourished. You felt it. And so. you felt it everywhere and uh, every day. And uh, the, uh, we had a store, there were things there. The Russians used to bring a lot of stuff and they used to buy from the Russians, you know, my mother. And it turned out that my mother was a better businesswoman than my father was, so she took sort of over the business. and. Uh, uh, they used to come and buy and, and, and say, look at it, you, you just survived, you just came out of the camp. You had nothing, and look at all the stuff you already have. So that's, that's all that changed. <laughs> nothing much changed. And one, one morning my father went down to open the store and there was Jew on the, on the window, written Jew, and he said, this is it. We're not going to stay here anymore. 
Of course, in the meantime, some of our relatives came back, and uh, by then the war ended in May. The war, you know, the the, the Germans surrendered, and uh, some of our family. There was a, my mother's nephew came back. Uh, he survived somewhere. Another cousin. There were some that were in Russia and came back. Uh, one of my cousins was also my mother's nephew. Came. He was a captain in the Russian army, and he. His mother lived in, in Israel from before the war, and he corresponded with her. So when he came, he told us that my brother is in Israel. So that was it. He said, uh, my father said, we, we all going to Israel. But could you go? But no, we couldn't. How could you go? The, English, the British didn't let anybody in. So we went to Germany to a DP camp. How did you get there? Uh, my father paid a Russian uh, uh, officer to drive us in his car. But the car only took, uh, let's see, he took the three of us, my two sisters. My sister that was married was already in Germany. She went with her husband earlier. And uh, my mother, couldn't, he couldn't take everybody. He had a small car. So my father and the two sisters and I went, uh, he took us to uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, from there, there he dropped us. As soon as we crossed the border, he dropped us off and uh, said goodbye. He turned around and went back. And so we, we took a train to Prague, and there there was a Jewish co uh, committee, and there were Jews already, and there was people from Israel that came and were helping. And they smuggled us through, through the border from Czechoslovakia to Germany, to West Germany. And uh, from there we went to Munich, and from Munich we went to Landsberg because that's where my sister was. What was Landsberg? Landsberg was a DP camp. It was a small, small town, and uh, there was a big DP camp though. There was a big DP camp, and uh, yes, I spent there. I spent there from uh, January '46 till the middle of '47, about a year and a half. So you were about 14 when you came? By then, I, yeah, right. I was 30 when I came, and I was about 14 and a half when I left. What was life, life like in the DP camp? Did you live in the DP camp? No, we didn't. We lived, we had a, the, the five of us, the three girls and my parents lived in one room with a German family. In one room. <laughs> How did that feel to live with the people who had uh, six million Jews? I, I don't know. I, 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 I always felt hatred, but I never never talked to them. Absolutely ignored them. We, we had a def separate entrance and never mingled. Never, never talked to them. Never. They had a beautiful garden and there were fruit trees and never touched anything. Never. She was worried when she rented the apartment that we will, that I'm a child and I'll ruin or touch or, or take some of her stuff. It, it never, I didn't even want to look at it. I never wanted to, never had any interest. I spent my time in the DP camp with my friends, went to school there. Uh, it wasn't a happy time for me because I changed uh, schools. The school I went to was a Hebrew school. Was the, the language was Hebrew. They taught in Hebrew. There were already, there were most of the um, teachers, teachers were teachers from either Poland or Lithuania. There were a lot of Lithuanian Jews, but Tarbut the school. Tarbut school, right? And and I didn't know, I, I didn't even know the alphabet. I mean, here I was, such a good student over there, student over there, and here I'm dumped into a school that I don't know anything. And. Uh, so it was hard, and I didn't like it, and everybody spoke Yiddish, they didn't speak Polish, there were very few Polish, and there weren't any, very few children my age. So we were all adults. It was like an adult world, like all the children were wiped out. And the feelings of guilt, you know, you know guilt. I'm the only one that survived. I had so many friends, I went to school, I knew so many kids. And nobody's alive. Everybody's dead, and I'm the only one alive. Why? Did you ask yourself? Of that? course. You asked yourself. You dreamt about it. 
and you never got any answers. Yeah. This is uh, when you're a child, when you're a kid. You now, even now, I look at the, the. I mean, I think about it, and I say, I don't know. I can't see any reason why I was the chosen one. There were forty-two thousand Jews in Chernihiv. Ours was the only family that survived. Father, mother, with four daughters, the only one. Were we special? Why were we chosen? I don't know. My, my father was a righteous Jew. He did more good than bad. He never said no to anybody that came and asked for a favor. But was that the reason? Or maybe the reason is that maybe the reason is in the future. Maybe my children or my sister's children, maybe somebody will one day save the world and that's why we were sick. I don't know. But you ask yourself that question over and over. What was your feeling? Did you want, you didn't want to stay in the BP camp, did you? No. No, I want to go to Israel. And I did. We went. Uh, my sister, one of my sisters, went to Israel first. She went uh, with a kibbutz, with Ali Abed. Tell us about the kibbutz. There were kibbutzim around in Germany. Uh, in yeah, there was in Landsberg. There were quite a few, and she met a boy that. Uh, she liked, and he was, he was from our city, but, and they met again, and, and he was in a kibbutz, and his kibbutz was being shipped to Israel, and she went with them. Even though it was illegal to go? It was illegal to go. She was, uh, she was maybe 20, and my father was against it, and my mother cried, but she said, I'm going, and there was no stopping her. She did, and when they got to Israel, my brother was in Israel, so she went to him, and, and she, they got married, and they are married. They live her, they lived in Australia now. Really? Yeah. So how was it for your family to try and go to Israel, knowing that it was illegal? What did you do? How did you manage? My sister and I went to, from, from Landsberg, we went to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen was on the, uh, on the English... Uh, it was a DP, a Jewish DP camp. Yeah, but it was under the British, not right. under the Americans. Mm -hmm. And the British sent every every month. They sent fifteen hundred Jews to Israel. That was the quota, and that's what you got: fifteen hundred certificates. So whoever where we, our names didn't appear there, but there were other names: the people that died, people that left, people that went to America, people that didn't want to go anywhere. So all those names were used. And we went to Israel. Once you got to Israel, you were free to tell them who you were, and uh, they, they let you use your own name. <laughs> they were happy that you came. When you were in Landsberg, did most of the people want to go to Israel? Outside well, the, the one I knew wanted to, because uh, I belonged to, our, to the Zionist organization, to a youth group. And we march and we <laughs> sang song and everybody wanted to go to Israel. My father had a sister at that time. My father's sister lived in New York. She was still alive, and uh, she started corresponding. She had gone to America before, before the war. Yes, a long time before the war, and she started corresponding. And she uh, wanted to send us papers to come to America, and we said no, because by then my brother was in Israel, and my sister, one of my sisters was in Israel. So she wrote my, my father, she said, send me the youngest. She says, I'm going to send her to school, I'll give her education, and I'll raise her as mine. You know, she'll be like Again. one of my daughters. And my father answered, after Hitler, after I didn't give her away, to anybody, now you want me to give away my child? And she stopped writing. She got very insulted. I guess she couldn't understand what it meant. She couldn't understand what it meant for my father to have his whole family and, and that she, he wouldn't give away anybody. So, so we all went, my sister and I went to Israel to, the, to Bergen Belsen. And then that was in March of 48. And then after the Independence War, uh, the gates were open. Everybody could come to Israel. My mother and father came. And uh, how were you treated by the, uh, the 
the Jews in Yeshua? Well, I, I, I personally was treated good because I had a lot of family. My, fa my mother, like I said, my mother had a big family. Uh, she had two sisters. Live? She had two sisters in, in Tel Aviv, and she had, uh, I don't know, nephews, nieces, uh, cousins, uh, big, uh, big, big family. And of course, we were uh, accepted as part of the family. I was sent to a kibbutz before my parents came. I was sent to a kibbutz. I went to Ashdod Yaakov, which is right on the border. So when the shooting started, border of Jordan. Yeah. When the shooting started, out we went, <laughs> Exodus style, you know, in the middle of the night. We went through the uh, mountains, and, and they took all the children, and the, the youth, Aliyah, and everybody was there, out of the kibbutz, because they were afraid it's going to get run over by the Arabs. And uh, they took us to Yagur, which was close to Haifa. But once we got there, I didn't want to stay there anymore. And uh, I went back to my sisters. She's living where? In Tel Aviv. And uh, I stayed with her until my parents came. That, that was the married sister. Mm -hmm. So my single sister and myself stayed with her until my parents came. And then we went to live with my parents. And she lived with her husband. So you didn't see much of the action or fighting of the war in the family? Well, I, I did see some. Uh, like I said, first of all, I was in Ashdod Yaakov. So the first few days, we were lying in, uh, not in bunkers. I was too old for bunkers. See, the bunker, you, you went only up to the age of 10, I think. So there, there weren't enough bunkers. So, so you weren't, just the uh, talot, no, uh, I'm looking for a word, I can't think of it now. I'm, I'm in Israel, I'm thinking in Hebrew, right. see? <laughs> Trenches, yeah. Right. Yeah, they, they had a lot of trenches dug, and when you heard the plane come, you know, you just slid into the trench. And when you were lucky, you were lucky, the, the, the shells and, and the fragments uh, were all around you, not in you. <laughs> Did you ever or, reflect that here you were, you know, 15, 16? Yeah, and, and again, yes, yes. But it was a different feeling. It was a different feeling. And. First of all, you were free to fight back. And I knew we were going to win. I mean, the feeling was such that nobody was afraid, you know. Uh, we were uh, setting, they started shooting, and we would go outside. I'm talking about the two, two of my sisters, you know. My brother in law by, uh, by now was in the army. So we would go out and see this guy with a stan, you know, with a, with a Uzi. We would go out on the roof and shoot at the, at the Arab plane, you know. And you weren't afraid. Somehow you weren't. I don't know. It was a different feeling altogether. You knew that uh, the right is on your side, so you're going to win. You felt yourself, you became slowly but surely an Israeli. Yes. Over the years. Yeah. How long did you live in Israel? Ten years. What were the circumstances of your coming to America? Well, I, I went to serve in the Army. I was in the Air Force for two years. Mm. <laughs> and I was a sergeant major in the Air Force. And I decided that after the Army, the two years were a compulsory. And then the third year I signed because I wanted to save money. Mm. And it was an easy way to save money because you got fed and you, got, you didn't need clothes. You got your uniform, and work was easy. I, I ran an office, which was very easy. I didn't have to do much, just tell somebody else to do it. And uh, I was getting a, a pretty fair salary, and I was saving it all. The, the reason I was saving it is because I wanted to come to America, visit my sister, and see how people live in America. I was free, I was young. So I want to see how people live in different places. And uh, when I got out of the army and I wanted to come, they wouldn't give me a visa, a visitor's visa, because they said, being single, I might get married and stay here. <laughs> so the Americans wouldn't give me a visiting visa. At uh, that time, it was hard to get. That was 57. No, it was 54 when I left the army. So I. Uh, 
when I was rejected for visiting visa, I uh, applied for a resident visa, for which I had to wait. I waited two years before I got. In the meantime, I worked, got a job. I worked for the Jewish National Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little different than here, you know, different world. <laughs> Over there I worked, I was a uh, uh, secretary. And uh, we, uh, and I waited until my time came. I got my papers. I came to visit. I came on a residence visa, but I didn't intend to stay. I just thought it was 58. 58. Exactly 10 years, because it was the beginning of 58. It was the beginning of 48 when I got to visit. Right? By now I was 25, still single, so I could do whatever I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I was free. I said, I'm not getting married in Israel until I see the world. First I see what I want to see and do what I want to do. Then I'm going to settle down. So I came here, I met uh, Dave, and uh, we decided to get married. Well, not quite so. It was a blind date, really, but then I went back to uh, New York. I couldn't get a job in, in... Did you come to Cincinnati? I came to Cincinnati. My sister lives in Cincinnati. Oh, okay. So she had moved to, to Cincinnati. My oldest sister never went to Israel. She came from Germany straight to America. And she came to Cincinnati. So when I came to visit, I came to visit to Cincinnati. Couldn't get a job here. Want to get a job, work a little, see how life is in America. Couldn't get a job, so I said, goodbye, and I went back to New York. I had cousins in New York. So I went back, stayed with them, got a job in an insurance company, mm -hmm. and I uh, started working. And uh, while I was here, I was here on about three or four weeks, I met Dave. We went out, well, I met him, we had a blind date. And we went out a couple times afterwards, and then I went back to New York. And he, he came, he got his vacation, he came to New York and spent some time together and said, let's get married. So I came back to Cincinnati, got married, and lived happily ever after. <laughs> and that was 32 years ago. 32 years ago. Tell me, um, you know, this idea of being a survivor is really new. It's about, what, 10 years old that the whole idea of, of being a survivor of the Holocaust has made an impact no, the uh, idea is not new. Yeah. The idea isn't new. And survivors is not well, new. It just got popular right. in the last and 10 years. It's a popular idea. It, it, it got uh, written about. It got popularized, right. if you want to say. But we all always well, knew sure, the same sure, things sure, we know sure, now. Sure. And we've been survivors all this time. So how come the world didn't come banging at your door asking you to talk to the boy? You know why? Did it feel? How did people, when you came to America, and you, did you tell your story? Well, my, my idea, you want to you know? Story. Yeah, my yeah. story, why? Mm -hmm. Because people felt guilty. They didn't want to hear about it. Here we were, here they were sitting, sitting pretty, and they heard all those things about what was going on in Europe, and they didn't lift a finger, they didn't do anything. And then all of a sudden they were faced with those survivors. And the, the, the survivors didn't, didn't uh, ask of, of them, didn't ask anything of them. They went their own way, they made their own life, and they succeeded. I mean, they succeeded better than most of them, most of the old comers did. And uh, they felt guilty about it. That's my, uh, that's my idea. I don't know. Did you try to Maybe. People? Some. People? Some. People? But they, didn't, they, they, didn't they really didn't want to know. They really didn't want to hear. So you kept it inside? Talked uh, among yourselves? Yes. Yes. Did you talk, talk to your children about it? Yes. They were growing up? Yes. From day one. Both from and your husband? From, yes. Mm -hmm. From the day they could understand and from the they knew who, who their parents were, where we come from, who their grandparents were. My children knew my mother. My father passed away in 58, right after I came here. But my mother lived till uh, 77. She died in 77. And she visited here four times, so my children knew her. So the youngest doesn't remember her that much, but the other two. And they talked to her as much as they could communicate. And uh, 
And they always ask questions, and I never hid anything. I always told them. Of course, uh, being a child survivor, I, I really, my insight into all that was a little different than the grown-up people. I, I, I think so. I don't know. But I, I didn't understand as much. I didn't know what was going on as much as other people did. What does it all mean, the, what you went through? I mean, what, what lessons should we, could, can we understand from those of us who didn't? I don't, I don't think we ever can. We can. I don't think we ever will. How can you comprehend that one people would set out to eliminate another people because they don't like the color of their hair or the color of their eyes. I have blue eyes. My eyes aren't different than anybody else's. All my children have blue eyes. <laughs> my mother and father had blue eyes. All of us had blue eyes, so what? So they hated us because we had dark hair or curly hair. This is, this is beyond comprehension. And I don't think, no matter how many books you will write, or how many uh, documents you will file, or how many, there will always be a doubt, because a normal person isn't capable of understanding it. No matter how many times I'll tell you the story, you can never really understand it. If you understand it, does that mean you're not normal? In a way, probably not. How? I don't know. I have a different um, view on life. I see everything differently, probably. I think so. You know, different things are important to me than to you. Different people are important to me. Different, I have different views because of that. I think I would have probably be a different person if I didn't go through the Holocaust. Has it made you a better person or worse person? I, I wouldn't say better or worse. I would just say a different person. So you're different than us. And, you know, I, I don't yeah, know if it was a lesson lessons of the past. Yeah. What we're seeing today, the effort of the American Jewish community yeah. towards the Soviet Jews, Jews oh, is... Okay. And the old country. What old country? Even the old country. This woman that my sister was taking English lessons from, she lent it to her. She gave it to her for me to wear. Very nice. Um, are you rolling audio on this too? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want you to narrate what the picture is. Okay. This is Purim of '47 in a DP camp in Landsberg. I was dressed to go dancing in a in a. German outfit. It was really a, a Romanian national outfit, mm -hmm. she said. Mm -hmm. okay, I had all kinds of ribbons in the back of my uh, of that hairdress. And uh, I was about, uh, what, 14 years old? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 This is uh, age 12 in May of 45. When is this time? That's May 45, four months after the liberation. I'm about 12 and a half. That's the way I looked. That was my first dress made specifically for me. It wasn't a hand-me-down. <laughs> it was my first dress. It was pink, and I was so proud of it. And I outgrew it before I had a chance to wear it more than twice, because I was growing like weeds. And Skinny, With more hair than anything else. <laughs> Years old, and I was visiting my aunt. Uh, they had five boys, no girls, and they, they, they used to go crazy when I came to visit. My uncle used to kidnap me and take me with him. This was then in 1937. You? I, I really don't don't know. Probably one of our relatives in Israel had it. It didn't survive with us. I mean, it didn't. 
something. You're what, 14 okay. years old there? Yeah, yeah I'm 14. And this is in Israel? I think this is the first year in Israel. I think so. Or maybe not even, maybe. Yeah, well, I grew up a little bit, too. <laughs> yeah. How much food did you get to eat when you were in the labor camp and the munitions? I always had enough food in the labor camp. Oh, God. I'm getting um, twisted. What are you shooting now is your birth certificate. Well, after the war, I don't even remember what we got it while we were still in... Uh, uh, Poland, or we got the copies when uh, uh, reparations you know, we got from Germany. We needed all those documents we could get. Right? And the city I was born in was, uh, wasn't bombed or anything. So you could get any. My mother got hers and my father got the, the wedding certificate. Sign a release form. Did you I rather did. Yeah, I, I oh, you did. Okay. okay. I'm Good. sorry. That's all right. No, no. You know. It's, it's, it's Do you have any of the? Um, I don't have any more of those. Any notes? No notes. You need. What's that? This is the translation. I'll, I'll give you that too. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. You know what? Yes. See, I can't lie about my age. Yes. <laughs> no one expects you. Yeah. yeah. They're They're so young. What are you gonna lie for? Yeah. Any? Yeah. Well, you know, you'll be a voice that's important to just, just stick around, otherwise you'll see her. They had a highest birth rate of any Jewish community in the world. Everybody was getting married. Yeah, that's right. What the heck? Yeah. Yeah.